next director of the American Schools with us tonight, Professor Bonna Westcott, who's right here. Stand up, Bonna, and give you a round of applause. <laughs> I would also like to call attention to another special guest tonight who came all the way from the Commonwealth of Virginia. Robert Lindgren is the president of Randolph-Macon College and has been a longtime advocate and supporter of the American School, not least for having facilitated our early connection with the Stavros Niarchos Foundation. Thank you, Bob, and welcome. Maybe you can stand up. I don't know you are there. <laughs> Now to John, the honoree of this program. There is a Greek expression, spiti horasiani, prokopi denkani. For those of you without Greek, a house without John won't achieve anything. So fortunately, the Agora will not be without a Yanni. <laughs> as we have John Papadopoulos here, who will be stepping in after this season's excavation as the next director. I would congratulate John. <laughs> now for a few reminiscences. Coincidentally, John Camp and I both came to Greece in the summer of 1965. I was trailing in the wake of my ninth grade Latin teacher, Miss Beatrice Blodgett from Minneapolis. And John had the privilege of following Professor William Donovan, an archaeologist, and much later a beloved Episcopal preach, a priest in Minneapolis, who taught at McAllister College and was leading one of the school's summer sessions. In that case, I think John got the better deal. I didn't meet John then, of course, and not even when we were fellow graduate students at Princeton in the 1970s, studying classical archaeology because John was spending all his time in Athens. I only came to know him in 1989 when I was a Whitehead visiting professor at the school working on the Panathenaea, and he was the Mellon professor. Among other things, I went, on, I went on many of the excursions, of course, in Athens and Attica. I learned that John could survive all-day excursions in the countryside on a Coke and pistachio nuts, <laughs> which he consumed many. But we're here today to celebrate John as the fourth and longest serving director of one of the premier excavations in Greece, the Athenian Agora. The number and range of papers being presented today and tomorrow is a testament to his legacy as both an uh, excavation director, or what Homer Thompson called him, a born excavator, and as a teacher par excellence. Um, behind the scenes, we're going to hear from many of the diggers here today. There were many others, of course, um, for all these years that John was leading the excavations, and of course the wonderful, long-serving staff of the Athenian Agora who facilitated these excavations. And thank you very much to all of you, um, all of you who are here tonight. Um, I thank the speakers for coming, and. Now it is my honor to introduce the first two of them. Professor Susan Rotroff um, began her work in the Agora in 1970. Since that time, she has produced more monographs about material from the site than anyone. Three of what we call the Blue Books on Hellenistic pottery, three Hesperia supplements, the most recent being the acclaimed Agra Bonewell in collaboration with Mariah Liston and Lynn Snyder. Not to mention two Agora picture books put together with Robert Lamberton, Birds of the Athenian Agora, and Women of the Athenian Agora. Her honors are legion. In 1988, MacArthur Fellowship. In 2011, the prestigious AIA gold medal for distinguished archaeological achievement and in 2020, the Aristea Award for Outstanding Service to the American School of Classical Studies at Athens, an award that's also been bestowed on John Camp. Kathleen Lynch is our other, the co-speaker, um, has been spending long hours in the South Workroom of the Stoa of Attalus, along with, along with Susan. 
When she published her UVA dissertation, The Symposium in Context, Pottery from a Late Archaic House Near the Athenian Agora, it won the Archaeological Institute of America's James R. Wiseman Award for the best publication in archaeology in 2013. She has worked all over the Mediterranean studying pottery from archaeological sites in Greece, Italy, Turkey, and Albania, and is the author of numerous articles and book chapters on pottery and its context, including a chapter in the 2015 Feshrift for John Camp, Cities Called Athens, edited by Kevin Daly and Leanne Riccardi on drinking cups in the symposium. Both Susan and Kathleen can be found in the STOA in summers, generously sharing their extensive expertise with both the excavation supervisors and the student diggers. This summer, they also will be in the field for some further work at the Crossroads Enclosure, which you will hear about now in their joint lecture, The Crossroads Enclosure at the Crossroads of Archaeology, History, and Religion. Susan and Kathleen. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Um, and we are both profoundly honored to be giving this lecture together. Um, it has been a challenge to come up with something worthy for um, John Camp. Um, and it's also been a challenge to somehow coordinate it. Um, so we hope that this sister act is going to work seamlessly. Um, and I guess we'll get started and see how it goes. It was a dark and stormy night, <laughs> sometime in the mists of time. Rain, hard rain, had been falling for a long time, filling rivers and remita with flash flood waters. This is the time when rocks fall. Centuries of weather, cold, rain, and even freezing temperatures had made crags, had made the crags in the sorry, had made cracks in the limestone of the craggy ridge above the stream of the Aridinus, the hills we call the Acropolis and the Areopagus. There may, may even have been a small earthquake or two. As the rain fell, a large boulder was dislodged. It was not perhaps so large as some falling rocks, but that made it all the more sprightly as it began its roll down the slope. Finding a gully, the natural predecessor of the later great drain, and moving steadily down the hill under the power of gravity and flood waters, coming to rest at last on the floor of the little valley below, near the Aridinus itself in flood. And if you doubt that Athenian rainwater can move a boulder, take a look at what a recent flash flood accomplished. It was the rock's greatest moment. <laughs> but. Here it is, as we know it now, fenced and tamed, mobile no more, but still powerful in its ability to pose unanswered questions. Now, rocks fall all the time. Recently in the United States, two huge boulders rolled down a steep slope to land on Colorado Highway 45. The Coloradans dynamited the smaller rock, but decided to preserve the larger one. In a roadside ceremony, the governor gave it a name, Memorial Rock. A memorial rock that memorializes nothing but the approximate date of its descent, which happened to be May 24th, more or less Memorial Day, in 2019. We thank Molly Richardson for bringing this rock to our attention. <laughs> of course, we don't know if our Athenian boulder made its trip in one dramatic go, like Memorial Rock, or over many years, centuries, or millennia. In all likelihood, it was the latter. And by the time there were any people present to observe it, the rock may well have been there simply forever. There is no evidence that anyone paid the slightest attention to the rock until shortly after 520 BC when the Athenian state surrounded it with a high parapet. So high, in fact, 
that the average Athenian passerby would have been challenged to get a good look at it. The Athenians seem, in fact, to have honored the rock by making it nearly invisible. When excavated, the rock was found to be covered with a mass of pottery, mostly of the last quarter of the fifth century, which had been placed upon or thrown onto it after the construction of this parapet. The sequence of events was hide rock behind parapet, cover rock with pottery. We've identified remains of 1,754 objects, mostly pottery, knuckle bones, and a large collection of river pebbles, and that is only a part of the original deposit. It's clear that some things are missing. Among the artifacts, drinking cups and oil vessels stand out. The pouring of wine and oil must have been a part of the festivities, and um, it, the shapes and the iconography have a feminine cast. Whether the deposit was laid as a one-time foundation rite or accumulated over a decade or two is still unclear. But by the end of the century, it had all, it had all been neatly covered by an earthen floor, with perhaps just a nubbin of the rock protruding. The subsequent history of the enclosure is also unclear, but it had gone out of use by the third quarter of the fourth century, if not before. The crossroads well, a couple of meters to the north, was probably dug around the time the enclosure was built and eventually took over its ritual role. We've only just begun our examination of its contents, but the huge deposit, almost, ex but huge deposit almost exclusively of water jugs in its lowest 30 centimeters tells us that at first it was a water source, pure and simple. Um, you can see here fragments laid out in the south workroom. But even here, there's a mystery. Water jugs are often found at the bottoms of wells, but they are often complete or even intact, while every one of ours has been badly broken and most are incomplete. Why? Please let us know. <laughs> but later on, around the middle of the fourth century, people began to toss in large numbers of cups, oil jugs, and other gifts, much like those in the enclosure. But they tossed in a lot of garbage, too. So there are some puzzles to unravel here. In any event, all traces of ritual activity had faded away by the end of the fourth century. By ancient Athenian standards, this was a short-lived phenomenon, little more than a century from start to finish. Like all the best archaeological finds, the crossroads enclosure was also a phenomenon of the last days of excavation. The parapet's outlines were noticed in the middle of July in 1971, when the northwest corner was found within the stony embrace of a monumental late Roman foundation. But it was not until August 17th that the enclosure deposit came to light. Over half of the structure and the deposit was still covered by tons of late Roman stone and concrete, but it was a scramble to excavate the accessible pottery down to a feasible stopping point before the end of the season, as Stella Miller and her team strive to do here. Final photographs show the accessible half of the enclosure largely emptied as of August 21st, as well as the silhouette of the photographer Gene Vanderpool, Jr. The other half had to wait until the following year. With breaks for Easter, downpours, and flooding, there's that watery theme again. Excavation was concluded by May 10th, 1972. Now that's not so long in archeological time, not so long ago, but two generations in human time, and the scholarly world has not been patient. That world wants to know what this thing is. Identifications, explanations, histories, and even partial publications have appeared at a constant pace, all abhorring the vacuum of an unidentified Athenian monument. They give us plenty to think about as Kathleen and I try in our turn to solve the puzzle. In what remains of my time, I'll offer a quick rundown of the ideas so far, and I will say none of them authorized, they just arose on their own, um, before Kathleen gives you a closer look at some of the finds from the enclosure. Now this one was authorized. Leslie Shear, then director of the excavations, published a timely preliminary report in Hesperia where he was appropriately reticent about an identification. 
a female divinity, perhaps a bit chthonic, but we will have to wait and see. But Homer Thompson, recently retired as director and not yet accustomed to his emeritus status, stole a march on him. In a one-paragraph stop-press addendum to his book on the Agora of Athens, submitted when excavation was not yet completed, Thompson argued that the enclosure was the Leochorean, the elusive sanctuary of the daughters of the Athenian tribal hero, Laos, who according to legend had been sacrificed to save the city from a plague or a famine. Now this really was very naughty of Mr. Thompson. Not only was this not his excavation to report, especially when most of it still lay in the ground, but stories of sacrificed vir virgins have an irresistible appeal. And this premature but alluring label has proven very difficult to dislodge. Testimonia on the Leah Korean range from Herodotus and Thucydides to the etymological magnum and beyond, most of them useless for its identification. Most famously, however, the shrine serves as a landmark in accounts of the assassination of the tyrant Hipparchus, which actually does provide a topographical hint because the action takes place near the Panathenaic Way. But at the same time, it should have given everyone pause since archeology span has failed to discover any trace of the existence of a shrine here in the late sixth century. But this presented no obstacle to the charismatic and golden-tongued Thompson. He argued the case at greater length in a Hesperia article in 1981, and his authority has ensured that the Leia Korean identification has found many followers both in the scholarly literature and popular sites like Perseus. The most extended development of this theme is a long article by Sabrina Battino published in 2001. As part of research for a dissertation at Perugia, she spent five days at the Stoa of Attalus studying not the objects, but the deposit lists and inventory cards of objects in the enclosure and the nearby well. Ultimately, she published these lists of contents as part of a second publication of the same article a decade later, a chapter in a book on drinking cups at selected Greek sanctuaries. This was another somewhat unfortunate development since the lists give the misleading impression of a complete profile of the finds. In any event, on their basis, Bettino developed a model of a cult of the sacrificed maidens as guardians of the transition from youth to adulthood, which is a reasonable suggestion, and particularly as protectors of the ephebes. For some decades, the Leah Korean remained the preferred identification, though other ideas were occasionally floated. The great molybdologist, David Jordan, noting a lead tablet in the well inscribed Bahioe, thought the complex might have belonged to the Eleusinian goddesses. And taking a step further, in 1992, the irrepressible Canadian scholar, Noel Robertson, declared the enclosure to be, quote, almost certainly the Fairy Fetion, a shrine to Persephone that is, if anything, more elusive and enigmatic than the Leia Korean. Then, about a decade ago, a spate of entirely new candidates entered the field. Giorgio Santoro, in a very level-headed paper published in 2014, argued firmly against the Leia Korean, noting the presence of a damaged herm in the deposit and the date of the enclosure, vis-a-vis -vis the infamous mutilation of the herms, she saw the shrine as a propitiatory offering to Hermes in the wake of this sacrilege, an ingenious suggestion, but with little other support in the content of the enclosure. A few years later, Maria Chiara Monaco identified the enclosure as a sanctuary of the daughters of, no, not Laos, but Kekrops, exchanging one batch of altruistic virgins for another, and I think less likely one. But wait a minute, what does any of this have to do with John Camp, whose career we are <laughs> honoring? Well. When Laura first contacted us with the request that we deliver a keynote address focusing on the crossroads enclosure, we were a little puzzled. John was digging in sections Omega and Row Row in the early 70s, about as far from the crossroads enclosure as you can get and still be in the Agora. And here he is a few days after the first sighting of the enclosure, extracting a grouchy Roman matron from the Omega well and staring her down together with Eve Harrison and Leslie Shure. 
Um, I am sure that like everyone else, he visited Stella Miller, Miller's exciting trench, but he took no hand in its excavation. Later on, he did dig a very tidy series of trenches in the Panathenaic Way in 1993, just north of the enclosure and the well, part of the endless quest to unravel the history of the Panathenaic Way. And here is his characteristically informative notebook section of one of these trenches. His great contribution, however, as most of you are no doubt aware, is his recent discovery of what looks very much like the real Laocorean, some 50 meters northeast of the crossroads enclosure. In addition to clarifying Athenian topography, this saves Kathleen and me from the trouble of arguments against the enclosure's most enduring misidentification. And so thank you very much for that, John. <laughs> But John has done more than that. In 1986, in his general book on the Agora, he remarked almost in passing that the stone might have been under the control of divinities of a nearby shrine. And this being a river valley, those divinities might have been nymphs. Revisiting this notion recently, Maria, uh, Anna Maria Donofrio has pointed out that in the days before the canalization of the Eridanus, the rock would have drawn special attention in flood time. Oops. I seem to have lost my last page. In any event, <laughs> yep, it's gone. Um, but here you can see um, a notion of what that flood might have been like. And we thought it looked very much like the kind of rock that a nymph might like. Well. Maybe that's a nice idea, maybe not, but let's turn to Kathleen to see what the artifacts have to tell us. Thank you, Susan, and thank you to Brian and Laura for this invitation and for organizing this fantastic conference packed with wonderful new ideas. So one of the things that characterizes John's engagement with the ancient world, whether it is in his very serious scholarship, popular books, or on a National Geographic documentary, is that he brings the past to life through a focus on the people who lived their lives on the ground that we excavate. In this part of the paper, I'll introduce you to some of the dedications from the Crossroads enclosure in order to bring the ancient worshipers back to life. Although I will show you some remarkable things, we are still unraveling the story they are trying to tell us. Please consider this a work in progress, including the photographs, more like pottery mug shots, that we took in the dim light of the South workroom. So no shame to Craig. Don't blame Craig for these. This is a bit of show and tell, but we are excited to share with you the incredible objects, and we welcome your ideas on the many mysteries. As Susan mentioned, at this point in our study, we do not think the Athenians venerated the rock with physical dedications before they erected the enclosing wall. Nevertheless, the pottery in the deposit might suggest a practice of anointing the rock with oils or liquids, a known form of worship. Oil jars of various forms number over 200 and are the second most common class of pottery after drinking vessels. The vast majority are lekithoi. Varieties include squat lekithoi, some decorated with red figure or patterns, others with palmettes, and shoulder lekithoi with red figure or pattern dec decoration. I'll mention the unexpected appearance of white ground funerary lekithoi in just a moment. Askoi and some exquisite black glaze amphoriskoi round out the importance of oil here. Other pottery speaks to drinking or liquid offerings. There were cups of various kinds, but per Corinthian, very delicate Corinthian skiffoi dominated, accounting for two thirds of all the drinking vessels. You see a heap of them on the sorting table here, just to get a sense of what we were up, at, up against. In addition, so in addition to medium and small versions, there was a group of very large skiffoi with hybrid Attic and Corinthian features, which share details indicating a single potter's hand. With 20 centimeter rims, these mammoth skiffoi held 2.5 liters, so perhaps they function more as craters than drinking cups. 
Despite this emphasis on liquids in the dedications, there are no official craters, and sadly for me, no indication of the symposium. The other third of the drinking vessels uh, included a few cups of stems or stem stemmed or stemless type. My slides tonight will overemphasize the red figure pottery because there is surprisingly little, only 44 pieces among thousands of fragments, if you count every blessed red figure sherd. But it does include these four stemless cups, one of which is white ground. I'll return to their imagery in a moment. Other drinking shapes include black glaze stemlesses, bowl saws, mugs, and one handlers. It's worth pausing here to comment on the quality of the black glaze cups. This is the period for 3420. This is the period of the glossiest black slip production and meticulously applied stamps adorn the floors. We enjoyed the tinkling sound the sherds made as we dumped them out of their tins. <laughs> small bowls and other dish, small dishes may have held offerings, but this is a shrine. Are there any clear votives? Among the pottery, there were some miniature vessels, figurines, and thumateria, but we also find these in ancient Athenian households, and their numbers here were relatively small. On the other hand, small, rounded pebbles form the single, single largest category of offerings. The excavators, bless them, saved 328 of these, but they must have had trouble distinguishing intentionally offered pebbles from, well, pebbles in the dirt. So we have to imagine there were more. Were these individual offerings, or perhaps worshipers tossed their pebbles at the rock like a carnival game over that parapet? But this is so cool. Eight of these little pebbles preserved evidence of gilding, gilded pebbles. <laughs> we have not found parallels for these, so please tell us if you know of any. <laughs> as numerous as the pebbles were knuckle, bo knuckle bones, counting around 300. Many feature modifications, which is not unusual. We show you a lead-laden boss example here in the corner. Knuckle bones occur often in sanctuaries and funerary contexts, but also in domestic ones. They had a number of uses as counting markers, weights in divination, which, which side is up gives you an answer, or in children's games. Exactly which of these roles connect them to the crossroads enclosure is uncertain. Several beads and an archaic seal, an heirloom, must have been dedications. We're not sure what to make of this group of 10 styli, some very short golf pencil size. Their presence certainly must refer to literacy in some way. But that archaic seal brings us to another perplexing aspect of the deposit. It contained several older broken sculptures. The head of an archaic core, which must have come from the Acropolis, part of a terracotta rider sculpture, possibly an acroterion from the royal stoa damaged in the Persian War. We thank Nancy Bukides for her help on that one, and a mid-fifth century head of a herm that Susan already mentioned. The Kore and Ryder beg the question of where were they from 480 to their deposition in the enclosure? And are they dedications or trash tossed in when it was time to create a new surface level? Ten ostraca in the deposit, as well as animal bones, including a dog, suggest that some portion of the deposit was trash unrelated to ritual. Or perhaps the poor dog got trapped inside and died. Oh, sorry, dog lovers. Turning now to the identity of the deity or the nature of worship, can, what can the artifacts tell us? There does seem to be a distinctive feminine slant to the red figure iconography, and most commentators have taken this to be the re a reflection of the recipient deity and or the dedicants. Susan already showed you this squat Leth Lekathos with a nude woman leaning on a rock, gazing at her reflection in a mirror. The second draped woman, woman hands her a necklace. We see the mirror repeated on the red figure Lekathos, third from left, on which a female figure holds out a mirror in one hand, balancing a box in the other. The box is a reference to women's adornment and dressing, something that is in turn related to wedding preparations. On the far right Lekathos, a Nike flies in, approaching an art altar, and removes a wreath from a similar box. The implication is a victorious match for the couple. You can see that the middle two lekothoi are from the same hand, 
same potter, and same kiln firing. The male may be the groom. The female head on the left-hand lekathos is a common motif, but the addition of the curved form, like a crescent moon, in front of her may point to Selene or Artemis. On the left, you see a generic female head. I said these are very common. In the middle, the one with the crescent, and Athena's head graces another. A fragment of a squat lekathos preserves a woman spinning wool from a calathos. On another, a standing woman in a peplos and holding a sash gestures to a seated woman with the familiar box on her lap. On this coos, a woman plays a balancing game with a stick. And on a Corinthian-type skiffos, a woman sits sniffing a flower on one side, and on the less well-preserved side, which I'm not showing you, we can make out a woman holding a hair, presumably a love gift. In general, red figure iconography from this period, the end of the fifth century, does tend to favor the world of women, but the confluence and repetition of themes on vessels from the enclosure does seem to be intentional. So we're getting a theme here of women in marriage. Eros, this time, brings a box on a fragment of a squat lekathos on the right, and on a stemless cup, Eros carries a large basin and approaches an altar. The world of men occasionally appears, far less frequently. On a fragment of probably a coos, a cloaked youth holds a spear, and a flat ascos features two warriors, an unusual subject for the form. On a bobbin, this is like a yo-yo with two discs in a, um, with a, a central, uh, 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 yeah, you know, a yo-go. On a bobbin, <laughs> a form that Alan Shabiru has published about and connected with the yunks. One side with Hermes and a youth is now missing from the ex excavation, but the other less well-preserved side had two males. If the besotted use the yunks to cast love spells, this also links to our theme of love and marriage. You have seen a fair number of altars, a reference to sacred spaces. This stemless cup has, shows Apollo holding a lyre and making a libation from a fiale. I'm not sure how he fits in here, but the potting, of this, potting and style of the cup links it to the one with Eros in the altar. But the iconographic world of the enclosure is also linked to the world of Dionysus. On this Skiphos fragment, a very staid satyr stands with a thyrsus. A more animated satyr also appears on a typical coos scene, the vessel form echoed by the coos on the ground line. And on this stemless cup, a woman, possibly a menad, holds a thyrsus horizontally, and a perirantirion peeps out from the edge of the tondo. OK, so iconography signals something about women, love, religion, and perhaps husbands. What about children? The coes relate to the Coos festival, and we have a few feeding vessels. But these could also have been used for adults unable to feed themselves. Strangely, several of the plain one-handlers have a curved portion of the rim intentionally chipped away after firing. We are not sure why or how the cups would have functioned with this modification, but a large black glaze mug may provide a clue. In this case, the curved section from the rim was removed before firing and an inscription added after firing in a tidy script that says, translated, I am painless. Is this a re reference to medicine that ends pain forever? Several white ground funerary lekathoi may continue this idea. The condition of the vessels certainly means that they were offerings, but why? Are they commemorating someone who asked for relief from pain from the deity of the wandering rock? Now our themes have expanded to women, marriage, religion, sickness, and death. What could bring all of these things together at this moment in time, 430 to 400 BCE? We do not have a solid answer at this point, but we do have some hypotheses. The date is significant as it spans the Peloponnesian War, the plague, and political unrest in the ancient city. We wonder if the Athenians decided to elevate the veneration of any god they thought might help them through this difficult time. It would have been a particularly anxious time for wives and maidens hoping for a match. Husbands and potential suitors lost in battle, those at home suffering from an imponderable sickness, and no sign of either letting up. 
In the introduction to the archaeology of Athens, John wrote, quote, time and again, we find a connection with antiquity and a sense that little has changed but the technology. Indulge us. We may be projecting a little, but we can see some parallels between our world today and the troubled years of the last quarter of the fifth century. For example, some of us look to religion to save us from COVID. This is Mike Pence. From, from, uh, while some of us venerated new deities in an effort to cover our bases. <laughs> Regardless, the Crossroad, enclosures, uh, Crossroad Enclosure offers us an intimate glimpse of city religion at the individual level. This paper attempted to apply what we call the camp method of finding the intersections, the crossroads of archaeology, history, and lives lived. Watch this space as our work continues. As Susan mentioned, we have started studying the well this year, and so far we have only looked at six tins, and we have 28 more to go along with 450 inventory items. There is clearly much more to say about this, uh, the, the shrine in the well. We close by thanking John for entrusting this important deposit to us and for his sharing his enthusiasm for all things Athenian, even pottery. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Susan and Kathleen, for um, presenting this mysterious <laughs> shrine to us, which the mystery seemed to increase. <laughs> but anyway, it's such an interesting thing and a great talk. And we are going to take questions. Um, I'm not sure if we're, they're coming, are they coming in from outside as well? Yeah, yes. Um, and then we'll take them from the audience. So I'll call on people, and if you are willing to have some questions. That We'll pass the mic around and please wait for the mic. Okay. Oh, Olga? Thank you for this great paper. I just have a question which may sound naive to you. Did they just toss the objects over the enclosure or was there a door where you could deposit your, your pot? Um, there was once a door um, that was closed up, but we don't know if it was closed up, you know, a day after they put everything in there or whether it was closed up 10 years later. Um, it ends up being an abaton, um, but we really aren't sure. I do think that some things were tossed. There's a lot of breakage and there seems to be deliberate breakage. Um, and there may even have been rather larger rocks thrown in. Um, so, like everything, our answer is we don't know. <laughs> Thank you. Gilded pebbles, anyone? Anyone? The, um, you know, the Eleusis has not only a rocky outcrop, but a well. So, you know, one thinks of that um, as a possibility. But uh, there are a lot of sacred rocks in Greece, uh, but how do you tell a rock is sacred thousands of years after the fact? Um, Pausanias mentions a lot of them, um, fortunately, and they're usually things like, oh, in Megara there's a rock where, um, you know, some heroic cure hero, heroic hero, of course, um, some hero sat 
or a rock where Orestes was healed, or a rock where one thing is so, supposed to have happened or another. So there's lore attached to rocks, and I expect the country was littered with the things that we just don't recognize them. Of course, there are famous ones at, at um, Delphi, of course, that are well known, as, as associated with the Sybil. Um, so yeah, I think there were a lot, but ours is special. <laughs> um. Okay, just one second we, before Julia. Um, we have a question coming in um, on the chat here or on the Q&A, I mean. Um, this is from Ethan Bradley. Ari, the gilded pebble, pebbles, maybe they were just from a wealthy person as a special, you know, favor offering of some sort? Yeah, so the, question, the, the point is that maybe just one person wanted to really up the ante on his pebble offering <laughs> and covered it in gold. Why not? We, we, why not? We have some that we thought maybe they had been um, placed in jewelry or something like a cabochon, but the, the ones I showed you have the gilding going all the way around them. So they, yeah, my, why not? We don't have anything to go on here, so any ideas are welcome. <laughs> um, Julia? I want to go back to the issue of rocky outcrops. Um, I think Eleusis is a, is a very important example. Um, this happens to be a sanctuary. I thought this, the crossroads enclosure is something that I am intensely inter interested in. I have thought a lot about it. Um, at one point, I hope to be able to publish it. Um, but for reasons that I won't go into, that hasn't happened. Um, I would look at the Latoan. There's a very, very good it, there's a very, very interesting parallel at the Latoan in, um, in Lycia. There, there's a rocky outcrop. It's clearly a special rocky outcrop because one of the temples was built around it. There is another one of the temples that is built in such a way to incorporate an earlier, uh, possibly wooden building. So I think that actually, um, is something that you, I mean, I think if, if you want to talk about an archaeological context with a rocky outcrop, that's where I would go and look. Thank you. Any more on rocky outcrops or <laughs> mystery stones or uh, Leanne? Is it Leanne? Yeah. Uh, this is just a question um, uh, about did I see some earrings? that in one of the slides you didn't mention the jewelry and i was just wondering if there was any it was if there was a significant amount but thinking about the golden the gilded pebbles i mean if they're dedicating jewelry as well um that just helps more on your theme <laughs> i don't think that's really yeah, a question um, there is a fair amount of jewelry i mean by a fair amount you know 10 pieces maybe um, mainly in the well. Um, there are also a couple of beads other than the ones that um, Kathleen showed in the enclosure, but there's more and more precious jewelry, some really um, splendid, beautiful, beautiful pieces in the well. So people were giving personal um, belongings, they, they must be personal belongings, and they don't seem to give both earrings. Maybe they'd already lost one. You know when you lose one, <laughs> eh. So, uh, there's a fair amount of that kind of jewelry, yeah. As well as a few pieces that are clay jewelry wrapped with gold, so uh, air sats. Uh. Um, um, speaking of jewelry, wasn't there a red amulet in mm -hmm. yes. the shrine? Did you? <laughs> well, you had an idea. I know, I thought it was one of those fast birthing stones that women wear on their thighs for easy childbirth. But I mean, have you found anything further about that? No. We, haven't, we have not yet pursued that, but um, this is something Jennifer uh, suggested to us in the past, and I think it's a great idea and something we need to look into more, because it's an unusual object. Um, it's the, one of the oldest things in the well. It's archaic um, and a rather um, rare form of bead, and so, yeah, we've got to look into that more. Um, there's a question way, way back there. <laughs> I can't see. Oh, it's um, it's Debbie. Yeah. Yeah, it's Debbie. Hi. <laughs> Thank you so much for this talk. 
Um, this is really interesting. I'm um, interested in the well. I might have missed w I, w when you said this. Was this well dug new for this purpose? And are there a lot of new wells being dug? If so, I, I guess answer that one first <laughs> before I <laughs> follow up. We, th we think that the well was dug at the same time that the rock was enclosed. So it was part of the, 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 the whole operation to venerate this rock. Um, whether the, it depends what you mean by were, were lots of wells being dug. They, they were constantly being dug, but there are periods of time when more are being dug than, than and we just had a, you know, you guys, we gave papers this morning at a different conference. We already gave, and that one was about wells, <laughs> Debbie. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you should have been there. There was a paper about wells. Is Mike Laffey in the room? He can tell you about, there you go. He's your man to talk about. He's got it mapped out when the wells were being closed, so he can tell you more about when they were in operation, too. <laughs> no, it's, um, it's great, because I was thinking about connections between water and healing. And, um, you know, if this is a new well being dug in close proximity to the rock and associations right. with healing, that the water kind of supports this, mm -hmm. um, sort of the use of water and bringing in water. Absolutely. That's a really good point. And as we said, we've done the period of use, the lowest portion of the well, and it's all water drawers, mainly what the shape three that we call a kous, um, a shape that we normally associated as an oinakoe, wine. But it's, there it is in the bottom of the well. So th even the presence, that, that to me suggests that the koes in the enclosure are m sh should be connected with water more than wine. So yeah, that's great. Thank you. OK. Um. I can't see who that is. We have a Thank you. Oh, cheers. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm wondering, do you have any ideas if the enclosure would be permeable to water? Would it hold water or would it come through and would that uh, interact with the deposit materials in any way? Uh, yeah, the, there are, um, in that slab that was added to fill in the door, there's a wide gap. So there's no question that water would have come in. Um, but water is an interesting factor that we still have not completely analyzed. Um, for one thing, there's a fair amount of weathering on the outside of the enclosure, but not on the inside. It's been suggested to us that there may have been a kind of microclimate on the inside that, that protected the walls from the weathering. Um, but I think we have to keep in mind the fact that this is a river valley, and it did flood. And it has flooded in, in modern times. I mean, there were times where uh, you know, we had to pump out um, the area and let it dry before we could excavate some more. Um, and the water definitely was entering into the enclosure and still enclosing the rock as it probably had for centuries. Thank you very much. I just want to echo what Debbie said. This was such a wonderful talk. You're such engaging speakers, and I'm very intrigued to hear more about the enigma of the crossroads enclosure. Um, so also building off what Debbie had said, the first thing that came to my mind was Hecate at the crossroads, and uh, not only just for crossroads, but also maritime context in terms of crossroads, because um, I can see that those are clearly uh, river rocks. They're such nicely well-worn, and so perhaps they were deposited on purpose or perhaps also just coincidentally through the rising um, and falling of, of the river, like you said, uh, in the river valley there. So I think there might be some interesting connections there as well as in terms of healing, like what Debbie said. So to me, there's a real connection to water here. Have you considered uh, that with Hecate and water in general, maritime context? Thank you. Well, we, we've, we've explored, we've in, the, in the, the, the privacy of the South workroom, we have considered a number of options, and we have discussed Hec Hecate has been one of them. Those, those little rocks, just to, be to, just to add a clarification, those little rocks are marble. They're marble. So they're, they're, not, they're intentionally placed there. There's no way they could have just floated in or tumbled in. Um, but what we don't know yet is where, what, what stream or river do they come from? Where do they come from? And that will be something interesting we can ask our geology friends to help us out. But, it, but increasingly, yes, water and the power of water seems to be a theme that we're developing. And the, perhaps the healing power of water, too, is a way of thinking that. 
So thank you for that. Hi, um, that, what everybody else said, awesome. That was a phenomenal presentation. Um, so my question is, is there was uh, some depictions and images of people standing on rocks and standing on outcroppings. Is there any depiction on any like um, pottery or artifact of what you could call like that specific outcrop or like showing an enclosure around a rock or anything or was it just people on rocks? No, that's, the, that's something that doesn't appear in iconography, and, and in particular this, I think the fact that that Oinakawe has a woman leaning on a rock is really significant, because that is not a common scene. So that must be a clue that there's something about uh, women in a rock. <laughs> so, <laughs> you see, see previous comment about work in progress. <laughs> If there is any other scenes beyond, like momentous scenes in life beyond childbirth and mar or beyond marriage and death, and if it's sort of limited to marriage and death, does that limit the context of this enclosure? Yeah, I, I, I showed you a, a sample of all of the different types. There's nothing that I left out. So that, that really does give you a cross section. There are more of each of those. Like I said, there are f only 44. I really, is, it was not fair to show you that much red figure because there are only 44 pieces out of really thousands of pieces. But the ones I did show you gave you, gave you a sample of everything. The, one, the things that we can't figure out, the, the white ground cup is so, the surface is so eroded, I can't quite figure out what's going on there. There's definitely a standing figure, but I can't figure that out. And the Apollo scene is an, uh, is an outlier, but everything else lines up. But like I said, those of you who know a little bit about red figure iconography, that this period of time has a lot of scenes of women. So th th on the one hand, we don't want to overemphasize that because that's what's going on, but the, the, that they're all there together in this one place, I think, is meant to be meaningful. But if you have any ideas on why Apollo would be there too, we'd, we'd be interested in that. Yes. Yeah, I could also add that we've just started work on the well, but there is some red figure in the well, um, and it seems to have a little bit of different emphasis and different scenes, um, but it's very fragmentary. So uh, we still need, well, Kathleen is the expert for red figure, so Kathleen still has a lot of work to do on that. <laughs> okay, I think um, g given the fact that you, <laughs> you were on the Zoom or whatever this morning and you've done this wonderful joint talk this afternoon, we'll give you a break from the questions, but thank you, the audience and everyone for uh, chiming in. and and. Um, and now I'm going to introduce the organizers who are well known, I'm sure, to everyone here. <laughs> so, as you know from your program, the organizers are Laura Galinsky and Brian Martins. And I have to say a few words about them. Laura's been part of the excavations um, of the Athenian Agron since 1995. And if you don't have it already, you should certainly rush out and buy her guidebook to the Agarot Museum, which was published in 2014. Um, so when she's not in the Agarot, she's in Chicago as an associate professor of classical studies at Loyola University. Um, I mean, not coincidentally, but she got her undergraduate degree from Randolph-Macon College, where she first took a course in Greek epigraphy with John Camp. Um, that subject, I don't know if it's, uh, I don't know, if she, but epigraphy has been the focus of several of her publications, notably her 2012 book, The Sacred Law, Law of Andania. Um, in the trips which I lead to the Deep Peloponnese, um, we regularly go somewhat out of our way to see this important inscription, which is embedded sideways in the local church. So it must have been kind of a challenge for Laura to read this thing <laughs> sideways, but um, and to transcribe it. 
Um, Brian Martins is currently a fellow at the American School, being supported by a Getty and American Council of Learned Societies postdoctoral fellow in the history of art. He has been working at the Agora Excavations as an archaeologist and researcher for 15 years, and he co-authored with John Camp the most recent Hesperia article um, covering the last five seasons of excavation. In September, he will be moving to Scotland to join the Faculty of Classics at St. Andrews as a lecturer in ancient history and archaeology. And they would both like to now come up and say a few words. Um, as, and thank you for organizing what looks to be a wonderful conference starting tomorrow morning. Uh, so before we uh, adjourn to the reception and poster session, Laura and I would like to extend our thanks to the many individuals who have made contributions in organizing tonight and tomorrow's events. Uh, Director Niles, uh, we are very grateful for your support in bringing together this group of Agora alums to honor John. We owe our special thanks to the staff of the American School, especially Neve Mikolopoulou, Konstantinos Georginis, Dimitris Gramatakis, April Hodges, and Dimitra Minoglu. We would also like to thank the British School at Athens, especially John Bennett and Michael Loy, for generously loaning the display boards that we'll be using this evening for the poster session. Finally, to the staff of the Agora Excavations and to this summer's excavators, thank you for your support and preparation for tonight. And we hope to see you all back here again tomorrow. We have a very nice start at 10 a.m. I've been joking that that's because we didn't want to give you cookie break at 9. So everybody, everybody sleep in a little. Um, and now um, it's my pleasure to invite you all to join us for the reception and the poster session. We have um, six scholars work. Um, you've seen them coming in. The, the posters will be available for you to uh, look at and talk to the people who made them, and the reception's a little bit lower in the garden. Uh, and the posters will also remain available uh, tomorrow throughout, uh, throughout the day, so you can enjoy them during the coffee breaks as well. So with that said, um, let's go outside <laughs> and uh, enjoy the reception. So thank you very much. Thank you.